afternoon everyone from here in Wales. Guess what? Still not on Skoma Island, but we are going to be talking about Skoma Island today <laughs> and all its wildlife. As you all know, welcome back. If you're here for the now 13th episode of Skoma Live, then we have appreciated you joining us all the way through this season, learning about the wildlife on the island and touching base with our wardens. And we've got another episode to bring you today. I've got the sad news to bring you. It's the penultimate episode so next week is our last Skoma Live episode so never has there been a more important time to show your support for all the hard work of the team this is of course a series all about the island and um, the incredible wildlife there but of course it's in partnership with the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales who continue to conserve the life on the island so it's really kind of looking back at the whole the whole summer the past few months has been incredible thinking about all that has happened and i'm really excited actually next week we'll be featuring some of the best bits you know everything from those live cameras that all of you, you have been um, keeping an eye on over the summer to some of the best bits with the wardens and some of the wildlife highlights too so yeah definitely um tune in for next week's final episode but of course stay with us because over the next hour or so uh, we're going to be chatting to uh, someone well phil Twidale, who's out on the Skoma um, Dale sailing boat, the boat that runs to Skoma Island and back. Um, he's going to be coming to us live from the water in the was going to be hearing from the wardens very shortly and seeing some amazing phenomenon that happens around the island uh, later on too. But um, let's always start with a fantastic competition and this week yes, the eyes. We have three pictures to show you so you've got a bit of a good choice of eyes to pick from. Here's the first. Have a look image the color around the eyes a bit, a bit of a clue a bit of a guess and also uh maybe the position or the or the size of the eye is another bit of a clue but it is an animal uh, species that we have featured in the series so far picture number two what do you think this news eye is this this is an animal a bird that we definitely have featured and uh the final picture is this one have a look think of the color think of we talked about about seabirds. Oh, God, I'm just giving you a bit of a clue. But anyway, let us know in the comments below what you think those three eyes are and who they belong to, and get your questions into the wardens. Now, let's get stuck straight in because we've got lots of updates to bring you. Um, I've talked about this in recent weeks more and more as we've seen big changes happen throughout the season, um, and that is absolutely true recently as well. You know, we're even seeing things like these kitty wake chicks uh, basically almost fully grown. I've talked to you about this previously, how they're one of the few chicks that are white at birth. They don't need to have that uh, camouflage that we see in the other gull species um, that are ground nesting, like our um, herring gull chicks that we saw a while ago. Uh, but really lovely, really, really big now. And then um, some lovely bits and clips there. And of course, Skoma Island is such an important place for kitty wake. So lovely, lovely footage there. Almost ready. Just a couple of weeks now. About to fly, uh, be ready to fly about five feet old. So... Um, what else? We've got a um, lot of ringing activity from the wardens. They've been busy. Last week we spoke to them after kind of crawling through some um, tricky substrate, let's say, getting a little bit bruised and beaten along the way, it seems, as they were ringing the lesser blackback gulls. Uh, it's all part of their productivity study that they continue to do uh, year on year. And of course, those chicks that they'll be ringing will then grow up to be um, those adults, as you can see here. If ever you have any issues with IDing your gulls, think about a number of characteristics your herring gull what color are the legs of a herring gull and how does that compare with a lesser blackback well a lesser blackback has yellow and a herring gull has pink legs so there you go something to think about if you're still unsure about your gulls um what else there's lots of boats in the haven just kind of in the bay there and the wardens thankfully reporting that there's you know good behavior of course it's all part of a really important code that's been put in place by organizations and by um you know the wardens and number of um op boat operators in the area to, to adhere to this pembrokeshire marine code it's all about preserving the natural environment making sure there's no disturbance to wildlife as this is such a significant place so lots of activity kind of building now that um, restrictions are lifting but thankfully everyone is behaving. And of course, there's plenty of puffins still. Any day now, we'll start to see less and less puffins. And we'll head over to those live cameras at some point and see what we can see today. Um, but yeah, there, there seems to be those changes that we talked about where those pufflings, and after about six weeks when they're growing up, starting to leave the island. And then we'll see those cameras and sooner rather than later, eventually just being more empty. 
and, and more full of sheer waters and less so with puffins, whereas we've seen lots and lots of puffin action in recent years. And one of my favourite things is actually seeing those puffins um, rafting around the islands. A lovely clip of the warden sent as they were out on the boat of the puffins rafting on the water there just around the island as they come back from their feed. So lots to see there. And of course, the wardens have been busy um, continuing their puffling monitoring. Um, some lovely little clips there and just this char character of a small bird which often people um, don't realise. Of course, they don't have all of those clown-like features that we see in our charismatic puffins. I say clown in inverted commas because they don't look like clowns, they're beautiful. Um, but yeah, lots of monitoring with that going on as well. Now, before I continue with the updates, I want to actually bring in the wardens because they have been busy as ever, but I'd like to hear from them a bit about one of my favourite, favourite seabirds, the storm petrel. So hello, wardens! Hello, hello. again! <laughs> I tell you, it's very scenic where you are. It looks fantastic. Yeah, best weather in a little while um, at the moment. Although we may need to evacuate any minute now <laughs> because I think it's starting to rain. <laughs> come on, Warden, we'll hold it together. We've got this. We've got this for the updates at least. Maybe when we come back to you later for the questions, maybe you'll be inside then. <laughs> um, but hey, loads of updates this week. You've been busy as ever. But tell me more about, about some of the storm petrol work you do on SCOMA because there's less, there's less storm petrols on SCOMA than SCOCUM, isn't there? There is, yeah. So it was estimated, it's, well, a while ago now, but there were estimated 200 pairs breeding on the island. But we suspect that there's a lot more now, especially that little elves um, have stopped breeding on the island and they are quite a big, good predator of those uh, of those seabirds. Um, and um, but yeah, so we we managed to, to get out to the Tom's House colony of um, storm petrels here on the island um, a few days ago. Uh, and storm petrels show very strong sense of phylopatry, which from which comes from a Greek word and it means home loving. So it basically refers to the bird's tendency to, to come back to the same nesting site year after year after year. So this allows us to, to look at their um, adult survival better. We know that they will be returning to the same site to breed. And um, so we go out there to ring them um, and, then, and then go out again um, every year basically and then we, tra we trap some of the birds that we have ringed uh, I don't know five or ten years back and this gives us an estimate of how many are surviving um, over winter so that's what we've done effectively and we got nine birds retrapped which were ringed in the previous years and 11 new birds all else well yes we haven't actually managed to check uh, which birds are from here and which birds um, came from somewhere else which is also po possible potentially from Skokholm even oh they're actually transferring islands, who knows? And in lockdown, anything goes. <laughs> Let me ask you, for you, what's your favourite time to see storm petrels? Because out on the water, come on, that little dance that you see fluttering above the water must be one of the, the best things to see when it comes to stormies. <laughs> yeah, that's special, definitely. Um, yeah, we we had a little trip uh, with Dale sailing last year and um, we saw two storm petrels um, on the water or flying past them and that was really nice. Yeah, so um, I mean, it, it is possible, um, potentially, well, not from the island. Um, people often ask about storm petrels and we, we say, well, it's almost impossible to spot them. You need to sit down with your um, scope and, and watch them for many, many hours. Um, and you might be lucky if you do see one. So the best way is to go out there on the boat um, and maybe even try and attract them. There are ways of doing that. <laughs> so people have done that in the past um, and yeah you might you might get a chance you might get lucky but um but that's not, like i guess the, the something that needs to be said is that when we go out to ring them we do it at night because once they come into to breed to the island they become nocturnal and in fact all of the stone petrol species except from one uh, are all noctur uh, nocturnal during the breeding season and um, so yeah it's all happening under the sky full of stars and yeah. I did in a very, very calm night um, so that you can extract them better from the mist net and, and it's, it's better, better uh, conditions basically to do that. Amazing. Yeah, They're, they are one of my favourite just because they, they are like juxtapositioning everything about the environment. They're just out on the water, tiny, tiny. For those who don't know what a storm petrel is, about less than the size of a sparrow. They're just, they're beautiful, aren't they? They're fantastic. Um, Speaking of starry nights, have you guys seen, and this is a challenge for me too for next week, to get a picture of Comet Neowise and 
a sheer water or something. Have you seen the comet yet? You must have, surely. No! And oh, there, uh, on the okay, picture. Right. <laughs> so, I feel like Soma for any, well, then that's the challenge this week then. It's, it's for those who are watching who may have been lucky enough to see the comet. It's um, out in the night sky. Until you really go looking for it, I guess you wouldn't really notice it, to be honest. But you guys must have such clear nights. Go out and see Comet Neowise, anyone watching. It's a fantastic thing. I saw it on the weekend. Um, absolutely beautiful. But you on Stoma Island get incredible views of the stars and the night sky. There's a lovely photo of that star trail there. So what's it like at night time, just looking up from Stoma? Yeah, it can be spectacular. Um, Pembrokeshire as a whole is, is great for, for dark skies. Um, there's... Um, eight dark sky discovery sites in Pembrokeshire and you know, we get spectacular night skies as well. Of course there is still some light pollution around which affects our, our Manx shearwaters, especially the fledglings um, when they head out on their first flight or they can be disorientated by lights and it might be something that people um, nearby in Pembrokeshire or elsewhere if they're near to a Manx shearwater colony uh, might find a grounded Manx shearwater. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I mean, as lovely as it may be, there's, that's obviously a massive thing for the seabirds there because they're often leave, leaving their burrows without seeing any light. So um, um, I was obviously the, not, the Oxford Navigation Group look at the, the strandings of shear waters. And, and how, how often would a shear water land, say, on the mainland or on a, on a boat offshore because of that disorientation? Oh, um. I don't know. I know that that team, um, they went on to one of the tankers um, at night and they had 47 birds, I think, um, in a short period of time, be attracted to a, a tanker. Um, wow. So, yeah, it can be quite high rates. Um, but obviously, there are uh, 350,000 pairs of Manx shearwaters here. So <laughs> that is a small proportion of the yeah. colony as a whole. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I mean, I guess an increasing... Um, important factor of this is is to reduce that light pollution absolutely um speaking of max sheer waters arctic is still here has arrived looking very fluffy how's it going with our sheer water chick currently what have you seen in the past week well not much to be fair <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's growing it's developing it's doing really really well they still come and go and feed it and um, so i think it's two weeks now yeah. so it'll be will weigh about 250 grams more or less and um, so it's developing really really well um, we it'll take a few more weeks before we start seeing potentially hopefully start seeing it coming out of its burrow to, to explore to exercise the wings to familiarize itself with the surroundings before it heads off to the coast of Argentina in, in a few months like, well in a few months probably more like um, September but, yeah yeah so, so, I mean, yeah, really, really not soon, to be honest, not soon after, after we finish this. Um, but the, the, the feeding patterns or the feeding um, behaviours between the, the male and the female, does that vary at all? Or, or do they literally just take it in turns, night by night? Yeah, so it, it definitely uh, varies and it won't necessarily be every night. Um, it might be longer. Uh, they have really good fat reserves and they'll be OK uh, without being fed. Um, but it's been uh, found out that the males provide about 40 to 50 percent more food um, to the chicks uh, than the female do. Um, it's thought that this is due to a higher threshold in terms of of them considering that the chick is full and um, so they'll think oh it needs a bit more food I'll, I'll keep feeding it um, rather than an ability to catch prey for example. Um, Another theory is that the females are better at controlling how much food they regurgitate for the chick. And so it could be either of them two things, really. Gosh, um, yeah. That's... Oh, go on. Sorry, sorry. I was Sylvia. going to make a silly joke that it's a, it's a tendency of grandmothers to, to feed their grandchildren <laughs> too much. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we've definitely been all, all been there, I think, um, definitely. I tell you what, it, it's been fabulous. I've loved watching that live camera. And um, yeah, right now, I mean, the camera that we're about to see very shortly, it's like full of full of lots of bits of twigs and, and leaves and, and various other bits of substrate. So um, they have they have been busy. So it would be a great one to continue to watch. Hey, guys, you look like you're in a fabulous place. Um, let's come back to you again later live for some questions. Will you be outside? I hope so. Can you hold out? Fingers <laughs> crossed. Yeah. We'll hold. We'll hold. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Okay, we'll come back to you very shortly. Thank you both, Wardens, and we'll see you a little bit later.
it's funny because um, you know, before we actually uh, chat to the wardens, we get to have a little bit of an update and a chat with them um, off camera. And they, they they are always so passionate and always have some exciting new updates to bring us. So yeah, love love chatting to the wardens. So get your questions in. You always have such good great questions and um. Uh, we've already got some coming in already so thank you for those and remember if you can support the series please uh, go and donate um, there's a link running across your screen right now or get in touch with us with a photo or use the hashtags go my life right let's go and have a look at some of the best bits from this week's live cameras because it seems to be a bit of perfect mania this week as normal as i say this will change um in in a few weeks time but they are busy they sometimes are bringing back feathers or sticks sometimes bits of um uh, uh, weed even along along the north haven camera there and of course lots of interactions although this week we've had nothing that seems to be directing the camera itself um the warden's actually had to go and reposition the camera a number of times because the puffins decided to do, um dismantle it themselves <laughs> so very very curious as always um and again we're seeing lots of these puffins bringing back sand deals because of course those pufflings are still there um, here for about six weeks and then ready to fledge but lots to see a couple of puffins actually taking an interest in another puffin an adult bringing in uh, <laughs> um, some some sand deals for their own um, so it causes lots of dra dramatic scenes lots of drama on these cliffs um, and just a lovely wonderful sight on these live cameras I can't talk about them enough you know we've been so lucky to have these cameras alongside the series and being able to follow the characters of these birds um, on an unprecedented scale, absolutely fabulous. So there's those live cameras right now. We're going to start with the burrow cam. Um, and if you haven't been watching, you're, you're in for a bit of a treat. Although you have to kind of make it larger on your screen and have a look at the top right hand corner. You will see the pattern, kind of the shape of that um, burrow curving round to the top right, where you'll see now and again the movement of a fluffy grey Manx shearwater chick, Sir Tom the shearwater um, and as we featured in that little uh, clip there of those shearwater parents kind of moving things around and being busy they are proving to be very very good parents to this lovely shearwater um, both off right now feeding either offshore a bit further offshore feeding for themselves or feeding close in shore for that chick which they'll continue to feed every single night incredible um what else let's go over to that other live camera um which is on north haven there we've tried to kind of swivel it around to see what's going on um less puffins currently could just be that you know they're not all currently actually on that cliff could be that we're starting to already see a few less puffins as we head towards the end of the season um lots of gull action on here as well i was watching a heron gull the other day and they're very persistent aren't they they just kind of hop around in the hope that they'll be able to lift a puffin sometimes do um but yeah make sure you look out for those puffling heads sticking out um, and always fun to watch, even if it's just one solo puffin. There was even Guillemot on here um, the other day. So, yeah, always, always keep an eye on that, definitely. Now, um, every every episode for the past however many weeks, we've heard from the one and only Yolo Williams, who actually this week is coming very close to Skilma Island. In fact, he's probably the closest he'll actually get to Skilma Island this season. And he, of course is talking all about one of his favourites from Skoma, which is the Manx Shearwater. Here it is. Hello everyone, I'm about as close as I'm going to get to Skoma Island this year. I'm actually down in Martins Haven and we're down here to try and film glowworms if we can. Um, the bay is behind me and then Skoma Island is just, just over the deer park over there. It's very windy so I'm going to nip back into the car. Um, so there we are. It's a bit better, isn't it? Out to the wind, it's very noisy. And I talked to you this week about Manx Shearwaters. I know you've already covered them um, on this program more than once, but I, I just want to talk about the actual experience of going out there to see Manxies. You know, when you go out and see puffins or you go out and see guillemots and razorbills and kittiwakes and short-eared owls, you can land on the island, you can go out for a few hours, and you can be virtually guaranteed to see all of those. But with Manxies, with Manx shearwaters, it's far more complicated because by day you don't see very much. They're all down their burrows, well one of the pair is, and the other one is offshore looking for food, either uh, feeding up before it takes over the incubation from its partner, they'll incubate for maybe two, three, four, five days at a time, or they're off getting food for the chick, for the one chick only coming ashore at night. 
So to really get the experience with Manxies, you've got to stay on the island overnight. And I'll never forget the first time I ever did that. It would have been probably in the early 1980s, I think maybe even in the late 1970s. And I remember setting the alarm to get up at midnight. It was pitch black and going out with this small, weak torch that I had. And it was just the most amazing experience. This noise, this cacophony of birds, hundreds of thousands of Manxies. And it was actually very dangerous as well because they become quite disorientated if you've got a torch. And they'll sometimes almost whiz past the, the light, you know, just whizzing past it. And that means if your head is behind that light, then your head is a target. I got hit in my ear, I got hit in the back of the head. I'm beginning to hit in the bum as well. One hit, hit me on the backside. I, but, but even better than that was when I came back years later in September time, when the youngsters, they've been abandoned by the parents. And so they, they'll starve for a few days before they actually think, okay, listen, I've got to leave the burrow now. I've got to make out. I've got to head out for the wild blue yonder by myself. And they do this at night, of course. And if you sit on some of the rocks there quietly, the youngsters will literally climb up you right over your ears onto the top of your head because they're looking for the tallest bit of rock, the tallest tump, whatever, to launch themselves off out to sea. And if that tallest bit is you, then tough, they're gonna use you. And they've got these nasty little claws on their webbed feet, and they hurt, especially when, like me, you've not got much hair, because they'll climb and they scratch, and they're going, ow, ah, and eventually they launch themselves off. Invariably, they don't make it. They hit the floor, they hit the bracken, they come back up, they have another go, but eventually they will make it out onto the open ocean. Of course, once they're out there, they slowly, they've got the fat reserves, they're fine, but they'll slowly learn how to feed for themselves. And that's the time, September particularly, is the time when you find youngsters becoming disorientated. And especially when the lights are on uh, inland, they head for those lights and good people will capture them, bring them back out here and throw them back. But if you do get the opportunity, do get out to Skoma and do get out and stay overnight to see the Manxies. Take care, see you next week. Fancy Arlo just being over on the mainland, seeing Skoma so close. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've talked previously about his love for sheer waters and how can you not love them, even if they do actually crash into your head at night time. Um, what an experience. Um, now, I'm really excited to welcome on our next guest. We are going to be chatting to Phil Twydale. He's from Dale Sailing. I believe he's also with Carl. Um, and they are coming to us live, actually, from the boats, where they'll be telling us all about some of their favourite moments from traveling around the waters of Skoma Island. They are very, very experienced. They know everything there is to know about the wildlife around this island and they've been running these trips for however many years. I don't even know. Let's find out. Phil, can you hear me? And if so, unmute your mic. <laughs> Hello, Phil. Phil, you have to unmute your mic. <laughs> we will be going to Phil any minute. <laughs> I can see him. He's, he's coming. He's on his way. Here we go. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Yeah, you've come to a really exciting day. We were, we're getting the boat ready to come round to Skoma this afternoon. First oh. time for three months. Oh, fantastic. So, look, you are so experienced. You know these waters better than anyone. And you as a company, you know, you've... You're the one main yeah. operators to Skoma Island. So what's your favourite thing about the waters around Skoma? Well, everything's exciting about them, really. It's just the extent of the wildlife. You know, Carl and I are on the boat every day. You just never tire of it. He's been doing it for 30 years. I've just been doing it for five, but it's just such a wonderful place to be. Uh, you know, seeing all fins and gannets and all this type of thing and all the puffins and it's just a you know magical place to, to, to sort of work really it's great to see all the smiling faces um people have got a, an idea what it might be like on scoma but when they come off their faces you know they're so happy because it's just exceeded expectations it's, it's a, a great place to work uh, and you, you yep. must have seen some really, really unique things as well. You know, we talked in the series about, you know, the puffins and the guillemots and um, some of the porpoise, but what's some of the best things that you, you've seen while you've been out on the boat? Well, the best thing I've ever seen, I must be about 
15 years ago now. Uh, we was out in the middle of the bay and uh, we had a massive thing there. See if it's alongside the boat. Wow. Absolutely massive. It was half as big as the boat again. And, and the boat is 11 meters. And uh, that was pretty impressive. That, that was like some beacon. I remember last year too, we were, we were waiting to do an evening cruise and we were over in North Haven and all of the girls, uh, all the volunteer girls were, were, were swimming and we had a 25 foot lion's mane uh, jellyfish alongside us, just 100 meters away, pretty awesome sight. So wow. never leave the, you know, the day you're seeing something that is pretty amazing, whether it be a feeding frenzy with gannets and dolphins and all that type of thing. Uh, some amazing nights watching the sheer waters and the dirty, you know, wet nights. It's absolutely amazing. Wonderful place to work. The last two years, we came more ripples open, which uh, we realized like when I first met it, you'd be lucky if you came once or twice in the season. But the uh, last couple of years, we're, we're getting a, a good number of sightings of, of the old Miss House Dolphins. Very impressive dolphins, very big, you know, from a distance. We think it's a killer way of reaching on the on the surface. Um, Absolutely awesome. I mean, you've covered so much there. Um, if, if someone, I mean, there's obviously a big change this year, but if someone um, currently, you know, wanted to still explore, obviously the island's closed currently, but still wanted to go out, could, could they go out with you around the island or? Yeah, from tomorrow, uh, we are doing cruises starting at nine o'clock in the morning and, and we're also doing spectaculars on certain days. Everything is on the, on the Premature Islands website. The big provider is all going to be booked online. Uh, it's only 12 to a boat, and you've got to have a, a, a mask on. But all, if you look, if you get on the uh, Dale Sailing or Premature Island website, you'll see all that, and you'll see all the rules and regulations. Uh, we'll be having someone on the beach at Martin's Haven to organise everybody, so we can, you know, do all the all, all the safety things, safety things with COVID. So. Uh, yeah, we're starting the first thing tomorrow morning. We've got a few people booked now, but if you're interested, that's, uh, that's the only way you're probably going to see the uh, the islands this year. And in my mind as well, it's probably the best way. Fabulous. You, you, and have you booked the in the fin whales, I hope? Have you booked in the fin whales? Oh, we're in trial there. <laughs> 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 wouldn't mind. You, just, be great. you just never know what you're going to see out there. Absolutely great. Um. Phil and Carl, thank you ever so much for coming on. I know you're busy. We'll leave you to it, but a massive thank you. And hopefully there'll be people watching coming out with you very soon. Yeah, let me just see you again, Lizzie. Nice to see you again. See you, Warden. Bye. 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 Oh, lovely Phil and Carl. <laughs> Honestly, you get on the boat with them and you will have every answer there is, you know, uh, every, sorry, every question. Oh, gosh, I've just got flustered. Every question answered possible because... They are so knowledgeable. They know these waters and, um, yeah, just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant staff and a brilliant company. So um, have a look at that. If we can't quite get the SCOMA experience, definitely get out on the water anyway. Wonderful. Now, um, there's a species which we haven't quite touched on. I feel like I say this every week because there's so much to cover. Um, but the iconic turnies, one of the UK's best waders, it absolutely must be. And unfortunately, we've seen massive decline in the curlew um, from about what 1995 to 2016. Uh, we've seen about a 63% decline in population here in Wales. And if you look at Pembrokeshire specifically, you know, breeding populations have plummeted to the point where there's actually only one known place for breeding curlew, and that's on Skoma Island. Have a little listen to this. Skoma is the only confirmed place in Pembrokeshire that curlews still breed. There were two pairs breeding here last year, and two chicks fledged, the first since 2016. Although curlew continue to breed on Skoma with two pairs again this year, the population has declined quite dramatically since a peak of 24 pairs in 1974. There's also been a severe decline in Wales as a whole, with less than 400 breeding pairs left an 80% decline since the 1990s, with the main cause of this being the loss of breeding habitat. Curlews are the largest European wader. Did you know that their tongue can't reach the end of their bill and therefore can't help with grabbing and swallowing prey? Instead, curlews have become adept at throwing their prey in the air and catching it. Or did you know that curlews used to be eaten in the UK you could buy curlew in UK butchers until as late as 1942. Both the male and female curlew incubate eggs, but then the male will do most of the rearing of the chick. 
In addition to the birds that breed on Skirma, we also see them passing through on migration. We had a group of 13 today, for example. These could be failed breeders from elsewhere, feeding up on Skoma before heading south for the winter. Fingers crossed that conservation efforts in the UK as a whole will result in a change of fortune for this fantastic species. There we are, the beautiful curlew, you know, one of the most pressing conservation stories, surely here for our waders and our birds here in the UK. Um, we need to be able to do more to help protect them in Wales and across the UK, absolutely, because of that massive decline. So I know that many um, organisations are working hard to try and ensure that we have curlews not only in Wales, but breeding in Wales. Um, but for now, Scum Island, yet again, stands as a unique place for the breeding survival of these beautiful birds. Now, from one incredible species to another very strange but uh, quite common phenomenon that I have had the joy of seeing um, off of the Welsh coast, southwest coast, and um, I know the wardens talk about it around Skilma Island as well. And it is, of course, the bioluminescence. It's just an incredible thing to see, and it's something that we do get here off the coast of Wales. Here's a little bit more about it. As the sun sets over the peaceful Welsh coastline, there glows a mysterious fiery blue mass beneath the waves. This footage was captured by landscape photographer Chris Williams, who discovered this alien looking spectacle at Penmon Point off the coast of North Wales. This bright glare may look strange and out of the ordinary, but it is in fact coming from a mass of bioluminescent plankton. These miniature glowing organisms are a key part of the ocean's ecology and are a fairly common sight around the Welsh coast and on the shores of Skoma Island throughout the summer months. The plankton, which is more commonly known as sea sparkle, is often trapped in bays instead of being swept out to sea, making this the perfect place to photograph their mesmerising twinkle. The phenomenon is a result of a chemical reaction that converts chemical energy into light energy. For this to happen, the creature must carry a molecule called luciferin, which produces light when it reacts with oxygen. The plankton are often found in large groups known as blooms, in areas of water that provide them with plenty of food and nutrients. This can include areas of water where toxic agricultural runoff is occurring, making them a key indicator for pollution in coastal environments. Their electric blue glow is produced when the plankton are disturbed in an attempt to scare off predators. Although not thought to be toxic like other plankton blooms, the species does release a high level of ammonia, potentially threatening other aquatic species in the area. It is a real kind of sight if you are out in the evening around the coast of Wales and you have the joy of seeing these wonderful plankton with that bright lucifer in, then you are in for a treat. Um, another reason why our coast is so brilliant, and imagine seeing that on Skoma Island as well. What a joy that is. Um, now, we're going to whiz on to go see our wardens again, get your questions answered. But first, I'd like to read out some hellos. As always, you guys tuning in every week make my day, let me tell you. Um, and for some reason, we have an international um, international audience, which is brilliant. I think it's possibly um, because of Puffins and uh, Nathan and Sylvia on the island there bringing in all the wonderful people watching. But we've got a hello from Jane Ayres, watching from Cloud Zidplot. Chris Taylor is from uh, watching from Austria. Ian Edwards, hello. Jason Davis, hello again. Susan Irving, hello, Susan. Susan has been looking forward to Stone Alive all week. Me too. Um, Bonnie's watching from Wisconsin. We know Bonnie. Hello. Um, who else? We've got even hello from Jason Latson. Um, Della Pinar watching from the Philippines. Oh, my goodness. I think that might be the furthest away. Um, Wardens, are you here? Are you with me? Can you hear me? Hello. Oh, You're back. <laughs> back again. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, some really good questions coming in um, this week. We've got a question from Garth Nicholson. Um, was there more or less puffins and shearwaters on the island when it was being farmed? So, a really good question. A little bit about the history there. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's uh, there was less when it was being farmed. Um, there are other variables to this as well. So one of them being that the species are recovering from World War II still, when there was lots of oil spills in this area. Um, but also, 
um, having livestock on the island compacting the soil makes it uh, less favourable for, for puffins and manxu waters as, as well. Fabulous. Um, what else? Um, question on storm petrels. How long have the wardens been monitoring storm petrels on SCOMA and are numbers declining? Um, so we know that they have been monitored um, infrequently uh, from the late uh, from the late eighties, more or less. Um, so Steve Sutcliffe, uh, the warden, then um, he initially started that, um, and then the latest census, which was done in two thousand and sixteen, showed that, that the population was stable, and we know we know that it's still stable. So there are uh, more or less between two hundred fifty and three hundred pairs found then, uh, and we now know. Well, hopefully that the population is either still stable or potentially even increasing slowly. So, yes, yeah, good news. Great. I, I mean, that's the one thing about SCOMA that I love. There seems to be lots of good news in terms of the general trend year on year of birds that we see on the island. But of course, storm petrels, in fact, a lot of our petrels we know little about just because of they spend most of their times out at sea and it's hard to kind of understand their behaviour when they are at sea because it's most of their lives. So, yeah, really good question there. Another question from... Ian Fairy, do you recognise certain individual birds on the island? That was a <laughs> <one>. <laughs> very good question. Um, in terms of seabirds, we don't have any that kind of stand out. There, there was a leucistic puffin here in 2018, I believe. Uh, we had a leucistic baby, well, chick guillemot here last year. Um, we recognise the birds through or by your colourings, so the ones that we ring. Um, there is a blackbird called George at the farm. It's been hanging around there for a few years, so we recognise this guy. Uh, and then there is a black rabbit uh, just up the hill here called Sam. It's been there for the last two years as well. <laughs> uh, and there is another one, uh, a brown rabbit, a regular looking one around the house here, uh, hopping around. Um, I haven't named it yet, but um, I probably will at some point soon. <laughs> But, but you really get a good understanding of individuals from all the ringing work you do, right? And often those ringed individuals return year on year. We know most of the, the seabird colonies come back to their to their burrows. But how often do you get to, you know, find a unique uh, animal that comes back and be able to ID them from their ring? Um, well, each year we, we usually recite um, at least 100 of the species that we... Uh, ring for that adult survival. Um, so a reasonable proportion of of the birds here for them species. Yeah, I mean that's a huge part of what what you do, really, isn't it? Be able mm. to monitor them long term. So that's that's brilliant. Now, um, next week is our last episode, so we're going to be coming to you just to chat about some of the best bits and and some of the you know most epic moments of which there's been many. But um, I guess we're also going to be coming to you live, hopefully, from a little bit in the field. Is that right? Oh, we're testing that still. <laughs> They're hopeful, so um, no promises, but um, we'll we'll do our best to to deliver uh, something uh, something different, hopefully, <laughs> for a grand finale. Grand finale! I know. Can you believe it's been thirteen weeks? It's just uh, uh, what an amazing series it's been. I've absolutely loved it. Um, question also: Have the guillemots fledged at all yet? I know that once you know some of them go, they all go. Is it empty currently? Yeah, most of them are gone now. There are still some late ones hanging around. There are still, still some birds incubating, so they are the ones that relate really late. In fact, one of my females is still on the ledge, really hoping for something to hatch. I think it's got three days to hatch still, but there, yeah, most of the guillemots are gone now, or like come and go, basically. Um, and so it's, yeah, probably not going to do very well, that one. Uh, but yeah, it's getting quieter now. Orcs are leaving. Yeah, and uh, um, some of the questions we, we haven't actually got to um, that we've had previously is about what happens next? Because, you know, it's not just a breeding season, is it? From now until, let's say, December, obviously you do your seal monitoring, but, but what else goes on on that island? Oh, there's still plenty. Uh, I mean, of course, there's Max Waters, and we mentioned the amazing um, sky uh, on, like, basically cloudless cloudless nights so we're going to be enjoying max she waters and the fledglings so they'll be here pretty much until the end so there were still a few around uh, as we were leaving last year on the 23rd of november 
So there'll, there'll still be some here and there's the seals, of course, and the landscape's going to change. And there's the autumn migration, which has already started. It, it, in fact, the last sort of two, three days have felt a bit like autumn. Where's the summer <laughs> gone? I mean, it's only just started. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah, it's, yeah, a lot going on still. And there's yeah. no school mars are still around and key to eggs. I mean, not, not for as long as school mars, but they'll, they'll be here. Um, yeah, so it's so now it's loud or was loud because of the oaks, uh, and now it's going to switch and it's going to be very loud because of the seals that we'll be hearing yeah. all over the island. They're very, loud, very noisy. And I can hear those oyster catchers still with us every episode yeah. <laughs> in the background. <laughs> oh, I absolutely love it. Um, well, I mean, it's been an absolute joy, and next week we'll come back with, as I say, a recap of some of the best bits. Um, I'll leave you to it as always you guys are fantastic and thank you for coming on again so we'll see you again next week thank you and they're always on hand to answer all of our questions so yeah lovely wardens there um, but that's all we've got time for today everybody a massive thank you for tuning in for this penultimate episode and we have one more next week where we'll be doing a big donation push we're going to be uh, featuring some of the best wildlife highlights some of the behind the scenes um, and lots lots more as well so yeah please do tune in and of course please do make sure you donate 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 but before we go Remember at the beginning of the episode, we showed you, I'm hoping you've got some of your guesses in, we showed you three eyes, three mysterious eyes. They're a little bit scary if you ask me, but we're just going to roll with it. Um, here's the first one. This piercing eye, of course, belongs to the beautiful Rhineck. Um, we actually featured a Rhineck, I think it was about episode four or five, very early on. Um, we talked to the wardens about that as well. It's a, a species of old world woodpecker. Beautiful bird. Love a Rhineck. Um, the second picture that we've got there, is of course it's that cap, that orangey brown cap of a tree sparrow who's we've been featuring um in the series quite a lot as they have been now breeding on Stoma Island, which is so 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 exciting. So we've got tree sparrow and our last one. I'm hoping you got this. This was a little bit easier. This is of course the beautiful UK's largest seabird, the northern gannet. So unmistakable there. You can see this kind of plate um, on its on its bill there that it uses to help with when it's diving at huge speeds for food so incredible everyone that got that well done i've just read in the comments coming up now jason doy said that he's really enjoying today's episode of stoma live me too jason and i really enjoy tuning in every wednesday so it's going to be so sad when um when we finish this after next week um, but i'm hoping that you all tune in next week for lots of fun it'll be uh, uh hopefully a really exciting episode and um yeah thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you again next week same time bye Thank you.